Hey everybody, it's Donovan with the Music Retail Podcast. I want to thank you for being here today and for watching today's episode. I think you're going to really, really enjoy it. You know, my goal with the Music Retail Podcast is to interview people that are interesting, that have something to give and to share that can help you build a better business. In order to make sure you receive future updates, please like and subscribe. That not only will keep you in the loop for things as they come up, but it also helps the YouTube algorithm to know that people actually like this content and will share it around. Okay, let's get to the interview. So today, this is a music retail podcast first. We were talking to our first non-music retailer uh, in the history of this podcast. It's going to be super exciting, and it's about a, a, a subject that I've been doing a deep dive in for the last month. So we're talking to Maureen Dorn, and Maureen owns a women's, a, primarily a women's clothing store, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's called Skirt. It's in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Did I say that correctly? That's right. We have three locations in the Philadelphia area. Awesome. Okay. I knew I said skirt correctly. I wasn't sure about the city name, if I, if I said that properly. But uh, so you're a women's uh, clothing store. And we're going to talk today about clienteling. And uh, the first time I heard that word, I thought it was like some kind of made up word, had no idea what it was. But then after listening to an interview that you did with Bob Megan from Wizbang Retailers, uh, I kind of realized that I, I, I'm familiar with this practice i just didn't know it had a name so can it give me in your words what clienteling is to you um clienteling is keep, keeping really careful track of your clients you know i think a lot of retailers have heard that rule that 80 percent of your business is done with 20 percent of your clients so really focusing on that 20 percent and keeping track of them monitoring them and assigning them to your team of salespeople um, and um, specifically keep, you know, selling to them and their specific wants, needs, and not letting a single one of them fall through the cracks ever. Right. It's basically like, you know, really good customer service and professional salesmanship, you know? I mean, yeah. and as we get yeah. through the details of it today, I think there'll be some listeners that will hear this and they'll think like, oh, well, we're already doing this or this is, doesn't every business do this, but there's probably going to be quite a few. I know myself for sure. There's a lot of these things on this list that we don't do, or, or more importantly, we don't do them consistently, right? Yeah. Like yeah. probably almost every retailer that's like, especially every music retailer is doing these things sometimes, but are they right. doing them intentionally all the time? Right. And, I was, that's how but, I was, you know, I, I've yeah. been in business 20 years and for the first 15 years, I thought I was doing a good job of clienteling or keeping track of my clients and giving great customer service, but not until I really systematized it did I realize how much lost business there was for that 20% of my, my clients. Yeah. You had said something in your discussion with Bob that you, you mentioned clienteling being you know, your strategic plan of how you're going to get to know your customer, classify them and, and assign them to the most appropriate staff member. But that most importantly, you said something for me that was just like one of those light bulb moments. Like I immediately typed it out when you said it was that if, if everyone helps the customer, then no one's responsible for owning the relationship. And I know in our that store, like, you know, basically a customer walks in whatever salesperson can help them over time relationships sometimes naturally develop where you know a, a, a salesperson has a customer or a customer has a salesperson they've always dealt with but that doesn't always happen and when it does happen it just sort of happens organically which is great but this process is more about being intentional about making that happen right yeah, that was a huge, that was probably the most surprising thing for me. When we made the decision that we were going to sit down, take a day, um, at the time I had three locations, thousands of clients, and about 20 employees, and we were going to take a day in a conference room and do something that sounded extremely scary to me and my managers. We were going to sit down with a team of women who worked partially on commission and start assigning customers in writing. <laughs> uh, what surprised me most that day was that some of our best and nicest customers, our loveliest customers who spent a lot of money were so nice and so lovely and so easy to help that everybody helped them. So nobody right. helped them. Right. So nobody called them on their birthday because everybody liked them and they were so easy. 
nobody called them to tell them when their favorite brand came in because they came in often. So they just kind of knew, right? And that when we started assigning those customers, the spend, the, their yearly spend went through the roof. I bet. I bet. Uh, and, and I know, I know for me, for sure, it's that same way. And I bet every one of us are going to have that, that realization of recognizing like, oh my gosh, some of our best customers actually kind of get like the worst follow-up and service from us because we, we yeah. just sort of take them for granted because we see yeah. them all the time and they're yeah. so nice and, and yeah. they love our people in our stores so right. much. Right. You know, some other reasons to do it, just some stats that I kind of pulled together. Uh, I had uh, d- done a deep dive in the jewelry industry because the jewelry industry is kind of famous for, for using this. And some of the stores reported an, an eight and a half percent increase in foot traffic, a 12% increase in sales, 4% increase in closing rate, 71% client text response rate, 59% in overall client engagement, just by following some of these practices. So like these are all like real numbers that have a definite positive impact on our bottom line. Yeah. So as we go through the work that's, cause this is some work to get this thing implemented. Mm-hmm. This isn't just a simple process. You know, uh, folks should A, be taking notes and be like, like planning to do this. And, and you're not going to make that kind of impact on your bottom line without something that's going to require some effort. So this is going to be worth it, worth it. So First thing, let's kind of talk a little bit about what it is. So okay. give me the nuts and bolts of, of how, you, how you're collecting your customer data and how you're implementing it. Like how are you okay. contacting customers? Why? What mm-hmm. kind of stuff? Um, so we started out um, early on that everyone, when they came to work for me, got, was a, you know, made sure they had, to, I gave them a pretty notebook. And they had to like keep track of their customers and write it all down and, um, you know, keep notes like, oh, she has blonde hair and she loves the color pink. So that we, you know, I knew that keeping track of your clients and building relationships with your clients was key to my business succeeding. So Mm -hmm. we always did that for years and years. And we thought that was so great that we were, you know, so had these notebooks that were bursting at the seams and some pe- some of my best salespeople had stacks and stacks of notebooks with sticky notes and all sorts of notes and then I realized mm, no that's not going to cut it and um I read some great books hug your customer um my Jack Mitchell was a great eye-opening book for me just about um how important customer relationships were not specifically about clienteling but it definitely made me want to turn a corner with this. So um, then I realized that it was getting too big. It wasn't get being managed properly. You think you're reaching out to your clients. You think you're keeping track of them, but you're not. And we were missing too much business. So mm-hmm. I made the decision that we were going to sit down, spend a whole day and tackle this list, this massive list of clients. Um, we, chose a number based on how, how many, you know, how big the business was in each of my three locations. And we rented out a conference room and each, and each manager sat with their team. And, you know, the biggest store maybe had a thousand clients. The next store maybe had 750 clients and the other store had 500 clients. I don't remember the exact number. Um, And just in a, just in an Excel spreadsheet and the manager sat there and I kind of bounced from, conference table to conference table to, to, so that, you know, as the owner, they felt all felt like I was really involved. And this was the part that I thought was going to be terrible and scary and people were going to get territorial. That was the first part, just making mm-hmm. sure everybody kind of owned the client. And we made this known. So my staff is, is um, a healthy salary plus commission. So commission is definitely a big part of their salary, but they can all pay their mortgages and have a nice life just on their salary alone. But at that point, but once we started clienteling, they're, they're paid so well. And I happily pay them that much because our sales grew so much with this program. So sometimes, so some of these women who started out with these healthy salaries five years ago, and this commission that was a nice added bonus to their check every week now their bonuses are bigger than their salary. Their commission outweighs their salary. Yeah. And I'm happy. It's the best check I write. Oh yeah. 
So we started out saying, look, we're going to sign all these clients, guys. What it means is that you own the outreach. You own keeping track of them, making sure that they know that their favorite new brands have come in, that they get a bouquet of flowers on their birthday, that you're telling them our big sale is about to break, that they're being communicated with, that you tell them that the special order that they requested just came in. It doesn't mean that if they walk in the store and you're not there, nobody else helps them. Our rule of mm -hmm. thumb is we do what's best for her, our client. So if doing what's best for her is someone else helps them, then someone else helps them. That's, and I had, I knew that if my team of players couldn't play by these rules, then they weren't the right team of people to work for me. I knew that if anyone got territorial or too concerned about their own commission and not serving the customer, then they weren't the right employee for me. They weren't living by our core values. We have a, you know, we, we talk about our core values all the time. They aren't just words. We live by them and doing the right thing always. All, we always do the right thing is one of our core values. We put you first is another one of our core values. So we reminded everybody of all of those things when we sat down to the table to, 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 to divvy up these customers. And I was terrified on the inside, if I'm being honest. <laughs> and it was not an issue at all all. I was shocked. You know, they, they, they lived by the things you live when you learn in kindergarten, they yeah. shared, they were generous. They knew. So when we sat down and we started reading out name after name, after name, they just said, she, I help her. She's, she's kind of mine. Oh, she always, you know what? She always asks for you. You should take her. And when it was like, eh, she, we kind of both work with her. They would say, you take her. I'll take the next one. Yeah. And when, Nobody knew who they were, which some of my top spending customers, because this list I pulled was of my top 1,000, my top 500. When we said, who is she? She spent how much with us last year? That was a huge eye-opener, a huge opportunity. We just started going around the table and saying like, okay, you're up. Next one, you're up. Next one, you're up. And when we finished... We had a great robust list for every single client. I mean, for every single employee. And from there, they had so much opportunity in front of them to start reaching out to customers, to start knowing how to plan their weeks, to start knowing how much opportunity in sales they had every week, to start knowing, oh my gosh, I haven't seen her in six months. Oh my God, I didn't even realize that. Mm -hmm. um, so we started there. I love that you had mentioned, you know, starting with your core values and like, gosh, that is so smart because there's so many studies that show that like whatever you kind of get people's mindset in, that's going to set up their thinking as they go forward. And so yeah. if you set it up with something, you know, a, a negative thought, then, then there could be a lot more, uh, uh, you know, more of kind of an adversarial process to it. Yeah. But when you start with like, hey, let's remember like who we're doing this for, why we're doing this. Let's remember that our core values as, as a company, let's be reminded of that as we go into that. Then they're thinking of those kind of higher values, higher purposes, and it makes them a lot more willing to collaborate and share. I think that's such a, such a strong key for this. Because you're right, this could have easily gone to be a, a lot more territorial. You know, people could have easily dug in and, and uh, resisted the process, but you leading with your core values first was so key, I think, in getting them on board. Someone once gave me the advice, you know, when I'm having these big all team meetings or even, you know, staff meetings, when you go, you know, you're the owner and you have, you know, such visions of how everyone's gonna be inspired by what you wanna say and how everyone's gonna get on, but really, what they're thinking is, how is this going to affect me? Right. How is this going to change my life? What does this mean for me? Am I, am I going to have to get home an hour later to my family? Is my paycheck going to be smaller? You know, how is this going to affect my day-to-day -day life? That's really all they're thinking. I mean, yeah. I'm not to say that my team isn't wonderful and doesn't want great things for our company and you know, they do, they really do. But at, at some level, that is the thought that keeps creeping back into their heads. And I, I get that. So I asked myself that before it, and I knew the answer was 
a great thing for everyone sitting in that room. What it meant for them is you are going to generate more sales, which is going to generate more income for you. You are not going to feel uncomfortable when a customer walks in the door and your colleague who you love and respect, and you both look at each other, like you, you or me, like, you know, it's everything is they, they want, they wanted rules. They wanted fairness. They wanted to know, and they also wanted to help each other so that guess what, Melissa, your customer came in yesterday and I helped her. She was great. Here's what she wants. Here's what she's looking for. We didn't have it. So next time she comes in, make sure you get her this. And then Melissa wanted to help Cindy the next time her customer came in. It just started this whole rule of reciprocity that they were, we're all in this together and you help my client today and I'm going to help your client tomorrow. And it, it really worked. And spelling that out for them when we started, like this is going to help everybody. This is going to give you guys, you guys are going to know exactly what to do in your downtime. You guys are going to never feel panicked when, when sales are soft for a week because you know how to make them spike next week. Here's the, here's here's the playbook. So Mm. we started there just a list. It's clear that what the benefits are for the the, the, the company, and it's clear what the benefits are for the employee, especially if they're on uh, any type of performance pay or something like that. How would you characterize the benefits to the customer? We were shocked by how much the customer wants us to reach out when we felt like we were being annoying or being salesy and we did not want to bother them. We, we found that that is absolutely not the truth. They want to hear from us. You know, it goes back, if any of you listen to, you know, are part of whiz bang training, it goes back to Bob's famous story about when he bought the glasses mm-hmm. and he'd never owned glasses before. And he had to, he came home and his glasses, his were dirty and he didn't know how to clean them. So he had to drive all the way back to the store and buy the special cleaner to clean his glasses. And he was like, oh, I wish they would have just told me. And then he goes, then a week or two goes by and his glasses start to get loose. And he's like, how do I do this? I got to drive all the way back there and get the little kit to tighten the glasses. Customers want to hear from us. They want to know when their favorite brand comes in. They want to know like, oh, you bought those pants. I have a perf- the perfect top just came in to go with them. And I know, you know, and if they don't want to hear from us, they tell us mm-hmm. and, and we, and we stop. But honestly, I can't even count on my fingers how many customers have said, like, don't reach out to me anymore. And well, we mentioned at the top that, you know, essentially this process of clienteling is like a combination of professional salesmanship and just excellent service. Yeah. And almost every customer wants excellent service, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. and they want to be treated as if they're valued. If anything, you know, you, you hear complaints from customers when they feel like they're not getting this type of service when they're not, you know, I've spent a lot of money in the store and I, you know, no one ever reaches out. I never hear anything. You drop the ball here, like whatever. And that's, I hear way more complaints about that than like, uh, you know, so-and-so followed up with me too much just to make (laughs) sure I was happy with my purchase or that I'm happy with the repair that I got or whatever. Like, yeah. 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 And like what giving you, giving every employee, giving them a specific manageable number of people to kind of own what it does is it allows you to get to know those clients on another level that you know, like, okay, Susie likes it when I just reach out and say, hey, how are you? How was that wedding you went to? And that op- then opens up a friendly dialogue, which leads to her saying, oh, and by the way, I have another wedding coming up. Do you have any dresses that would work for that? But somebody else just wants to know, hey, having a sale, it's 50% off. It starts on Tuesday. When you right. have a manageable number of customers that you get to know at that level, you know what works and what doesn't work for each and every client, how they like to be reached. They, they, some clients want to be, want to be reached via text message and they don't respond, but they still want you to send text messages and then they just show up. Some customers like to get into a lengthy conversation about their life and their fight with their husband and all of it. Some customers want you to send them pictures. So like you really can know on a grassroots level how every single client prefers to be communicated with when you can divvy up your clients between your staff. Have you, uh, what, we, we are actually talking about this today in our weekly management meeting and one of our uh, managers wondered if there is like, uh, if, if 
the customer's uh, appreciation of this type of service varied based on age. You know, he had wondered if maybe like older customers value this type of service, but younger ones are, are put off by it. What, what's been your experience with it? Do you notice a difference between generations on who likes this type of service or not? Um, our customer base ranges from, you know, 20s to late 60s, early 70s, honestly. But the bulk of my customer base is probably late 30s to early 50s. And everybody prefers, like everybody we find across the board, everybody wants to hear from us, but the way in which they respond to it varies. Like um, younger might not respond. They just like, like to get the text, read it and don't feel obligated to write back. Or maybe they just thumbs up our text, you know, mm -hmm. whereas an older client might really want to call us if they get a text from us not text back and like yeah. someone where right there in the middle might get into like a lengthy conversation via text or be like, Hey, send me a picture of that. So like how they respond to it might be different based on their age, but they all want to hear from us. Gotcha. And I, you know, I would imagine everybody likes good service, you know, yeah. I mean, and, and like you mentioned, if, if few that don't, they can totally opt out of it. But I mean, I found that the younger they are, the less they want to actually communicate. Like if they can find out if we have the size, what our hours are without having to actually pick up a phone and call or speak with anyone live, they're happy. Like mm -hmm. they do not want live communication if they're like 30 or younger. Right. <laughs> they hate having to actually talk to someone if they're right. like 33 or younger. <laughs> I mean, I'm older than that, but I don't use my phone to talk on. You know. Right. Exactly. You know, like when you text someone and then they call you, millennials hate that. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> like, why are you exactly. calling me? Just text me back. Exactly. Well, I think another, uh, you know, for anyone that's, uh, you know, kind of has their doubts or is a naysayer to recognize is this is different than like some kind of mass texting email thing where it's just sort of, you know, a general generic message is going up to all these folks. Like we've all gotten that message. And, we do and, that. We do that too sometimes, but this is different. right. Yeah. This, this is one-on-one. -on -one. This is, you know, a salesperson reaching out specifically to a, a customer and it's, it's a much different type of experience yeah. and, uh, than just some, some, and, and it, yeah, it, like you said, there's a time and a place for the mass stuff, but this is, this is much more uh, focused. So um that process where you had your whole team together uh, in this conference room mm -hmm. and you mentioned based on the size of the store, there could be 500 customers, there could be over a thousand customers. How long did that initial process take of just assigning customers? It took a whole day, um, you know, with like a break for lunch and stuff, but it went faster than I thought. Um, and we made sure we, d we did other things that day. So we like, um, had built, I knew this was going to be my big project. So I'd spent a couple months leading up to it. So we did try to incorporate some fun things into that day, like to build camar camaraderie. We like spent a couple months leading up to it, ha giving everyone like skirt. This is a Bob Nagin idea, Oba's bang idea. We had um, given everyone like skirt bucks and we said like, okay, everyone here's a hundred one dollar skirt bucks and you have to hand these out to your colleagues for the next several months, every time they do something that you think is awesome and everyone save your skirt bucks. And at like, so as like a, a break in the, you know, long day of doing this, I had like a raffle set up um, on one side of the conference room of like products from, from my store that I knew they would love. Um, I think I did like, two, two um, paid vacation days and you could take your skirt bucks and put them in the raffle. We like raffled those things off. So we tried to like break up the day with like some really just fun um, team building type stuff so that mm -hmm. it wasn't all like heavy and work. So we, you know, did that kind of stuff too. We, I had, I brought in like a great lunch um, and treated everyone to lunch and then when the day was done, we all had a client. We all had these robust client lists and 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 instructions on how to start with to start with them. So level one was just a list. Um, that's how we started. As we 
have, and it was an Excel spreadsheet and everybody knew everyone else's list. So you, cause you had to be able to, um, know who everyone's, it was shared. It was public. Like you had to right. be able to look at other people's client list too. So then as it's, and I was making this up as I went along. So there was no rule book. So then as you know, five years later, fast forward five years later, we, we learned, um, so let me stop you real quick. So mm -hmm. I, uh, a couple more questions on just this initial process and mm -hmm. then I want to get into the nuts yeah. and bolts mm -hmm. of it. So um, how far back did you go when you were kind of putting together your customer list? We looked at it a bunch of different ways. So I pulled like top customers from the, from that year, top customers from two years, um, lost customers. And I sat with it and played with it and then I came up with what I thought was like, okay, these are the, there was like, a, I think we did top customers over the one year, but then I, when I looked at top customers over two year, I cherry picked like, Ooh, no, we shouldn't have lost her. Like these, let's add these other hundred ladies. Like I, I knew when I, if I saw someone who didn't show up in our top customers from the year before, who's who, whose spend was big, you know, then I added them. You know, when I saw a lost customer from, you know, three years ago who spent, you know, who spend was big, I added them too. So I didn't have like a hard and fast rule. I started with our top customers from the previous year and then, you know, added probably another hundred customers just from perusing older lists. Gotcha. And then um, if I remember correctly, you also kind of ranked the customers as an A, B. So that came customer. later. So okay, tell me, yes. tell me what's an A customer versus a C customer and kind of tell me what that ranking is and how that So happens. we look at them by spend. So by spend, we now learn to rank our customers A, B, and C. So A are our biggest spend. So we just um, have a number, um, you know, based on their yearly spend. And it does shift every year a little bit. Um, because as we work to get our average sale up and to get our customers to spend more, sometimes you can make it into the A ranking by spending, you know, $5,000 over the course of a year. And sometimes you got to spend $6,000 to make it into that A category. So, um, and then, and then everybody, you know, my top salesperson who's worked for me for 15 years, her A, she's going to have a lot more A's than someone brand new. So sometimes we like, push a newer staff member we like say like well i know she's technically a b because she didn't make the like cut off to be an a but like let's treat her as an a for you because i really think she has potential so because when someone's an a customer we do several things for them over the course of the year we send them special marketing things we really spoil our a customers we spend a lot of money on our a customers to keep them a customers gotcha. but in terms of clientele They'll have their A customers, they'll have their B customers that just based on spend, um, you know, just don't spend as much as their B customers. And then they have their C customers, which is everyone else, <laughs> everyone. So every single day. So, th so what, ma what morphed from that first day, which was an Excel spreadsheet, I don't even have a Google doc yet, is now a Google doc. And it's shared between all locations um, in the company. And it's a living, breathing document. And at the end of every day, we print up a customer. We print, we have our point of sale system lets us, allows us to print up a sheet of every customer that shopped and who helped them. And it's their job as part of their closing um, duties to one person prints up the list. And as you're closing out for the day, you take that list, you go to your sheet on the Google doc and you either, and you look at your sales that day and you add any notes you want to your Google doc about your A's and your B's that you helped that day, or you add someone to your C list if they're new and they're, you've never helped them before. And our goal is constantly to be moving our C customers into the B ranking and our B customers into the A ranking. And it is the job of our managers 
because it's a lot of work to do this. And some days people are like, I have to run. I have to go pick my kids. I don't have the time to do this. Then it falls behind. And sometimes there's one day a week that they're doing three or four days of this data entry on their Google doc. Or there's some people who hate Google doc and they just write it all down. And it's the job of the manager to decide whether they're just going to fill in that Google doc for them, or they're going to be like, Nope, you got to sit and do it. I'll help you. It's the job of really good managers to manage these lists because that manager knows that the success of her store is the success of this clientele program. So they are really invested in this Google doc, my managers. And, um, that just constantly referring back to that list. So that list also has on it lots of notes. Um, When's the last time you texted them? When's the last time you called them? When's the last time they shopped? When's the last time that, when's the last time they got one of our major marketing pieces? So it's filled with data. And then as it's gotten even more robust, we've started taking these sheets and subcategorizing them like, they are a sale customer. They only want to shop when it's one of our clearance times. And we love those customers too, because we need them too. We need to get rid of that sale stuff. And we, yeah. we to, so we know to just reach out to them during sale time or some staff is better at it than others. And those are the people that get paid the most. They have subclassed their lists to say, They shop by these brands. I need to call them every time this brand comes in. So when a delivery arrives, they all they have to go go, do is go to their Google doc and search Veronica Beard. That's the name of one of the designers I carry. And be like, oh, here's my list. Here's who I need to text today. Some people aren't as savvy with their lists and they have to dig through and call, you know, do, do, do it the old fashioned way. But that's where our lists have gotten to now. And our managers do, you know, we aim for weekly sit downs with each staff member and their Google doc to sit down and be like, okay, your sales are down. What's going on? How can we help? Let's look, let's pull out your Google list. Where are the opportunities there? Um, the other opportunity is that when they print out these lists at the end of every day, if, you, if you've helped someone that isn't on your list, A, B, or C list, you can go into everyone else's list and it's alphabetical and you can be like, Oh, okay. She's not on my list. She's on Suzanne's list. I really connect. But when's the last time Suzanne helped her? Ooh, it's been a year. I really connected with her. And I really think that I could develop this customer better than my colleague. I'm going to have a candid conversation with her and see if she'd be open to me taking her over and I think I could do more business with her. I think that we had a connection and that, you know, maybe you helped her one time. So she got put on your list, but I feel like this is the right thing for her, for the customer. Right. right. And so those candid conversations have to happen right away mm. in the moment. And they do. And a lot of times they say like, yeah, yeah, t- totally take her. I don't even remember who she is. And when those, ha- when those conversations happen all the time, it makes it much more likely for, that person to then say like, okay, great. Thank you so much. And you know what? I noticed you helped my other customer. Why don't you take her? Yeah. And there's just a constant movement. So these lists are living and breathing and constantly changing. And And that's the key to make them successful. Like it has to be properly managed. I want to back up a little bit and just uh, address a couple of things. So give me an idea of some of the uh, benefits that a customer gets from being an A customer versus what does a B customer get and what does a C customer get? I mean, we do great things for all of our customers. I'm super generous with, we have no return policy. You can return anything you want, anytime you want. Um, Always, we do tons of, um, you know, charity fundraisers where I give away tons and tons to like schools. I'm of the whiz bang school where I try to be customer focused all the time. But there are big benefits for me. So um, twice a year, I send out a marketing, a direct mail marketing campaign to my A's. So for instance, um, let's see, this spring, they got, um, it was delivered the day 
that the pandemic <laughs> hit literally, but um, they got a custom designed beautiful box. And in one compartment of the box was a fresh bouquet of flowers. In the other compartment of the box was our spring lookbook, a, um, a book of all the, um, the, you know, fashions we were carrying this week. And in the other compartment of the book was a letter from me to them and a $200 gift certificate to our store. Um, the $200 gift certificate is based on these A customers average spend. Um, so we know that it turns out to be about 10% of their average sale, but we know that through really knowing these customers and what we can get out of them. What we've learned from, this is a big takeaway from our A customers. What we learned is that if we know you're coming in to shop, if we know it, like we really tried to encourage appointment making for a while. Like we had an appointment scheduling app. We really, really were like, make an appointment, make an appointment. We'll have champagne. We'll have the whole. And our customer didn't want to be locked down to a time. We really wanted to encourage that because we knew if they had an appointment, their average spend would go up. We had tracked mm -hmm. it. We had all the data. So we relaxed that because we found that even if we knew they were coming on a certain day in the afternoon, just that general, and we could prepare if we had a rack pulled of clothing, if we had a dressing room ready to go, their average sale tripled. Holy cow. And we, this is all through data collection. This isn't just off of like, this is through like measuring. So once you start clientele and you're in constant communication with your customer, they don't just pop in. They're talking to their person all the time. So they're like, oh, when are you there on Tuesday? All right, I have a dentist appointment. So I think I'm going to come in after my dentist appointment. You know when they're coming. You right. prepare. You have it all. You know what size you have in this and what size you ha don't have in that. You get what they need. And it's even if it's not, uh, we like to have it pulled on a rolling rack and ready to go for them. But if you can't go to that extent, you at least mentally know what you're going to show them and you're prepared and your sale goes way up. In my case, it triples. In your case, I am guarantee you it's going to go way up. Yeah. So once you have that relationship with them, the reason I knew my average sale is about $500. But for my A customers, when I know they're coming, it's $2,000. That's why I'm able to gift them with a $200 gift card. And it really is only a 10% off coupon. Right, right. But they and, and you just to clarify for if in case anyone's not a whiz bang retailer, that uh, it's not a, a coupon. It's an actual gift card. So technically they could come in and just spend 200 bucks and give yeah. you a gift card and walk out the door. But the whole idea behind givers get is, you know, yeah. customers yeah. treat uh, yeah. coupons like trash and like uh, gift cards like cash. That's a right. Megan thing. Right. And, uh, and we've so tracked it all. We've been doing that for years. And if it wasn't working and people were just spending $200 and leaving it, leaving, we obviously wouldn't be doing it anymore, but it works. Right. That's awesome. So they get that, they get a Christmas gift from us, a beautiful Christmas. They, they, get, they get all these sorts of things because we're able to track their spend so much and we know they're worth it. Right. What does a B customer get? A B customer gets, um, an e gets a $50 gift card. So not a $200 gift card. She doesn't get the fresh flowers delivered, but she gets all sorts of communication and lesser gift cards and, you know, more she gets and she gets the constant grooming to you know make her and she still gets you know treated like you know wonderfully right you had said something in your conversation with bob that you know in terms of like the the quality of relationship and service you're treating them all basically the same oh my God, like, yeah. because a 25 dollars customer you said is just as important as a 2500 dollars customer because you don't know what the lifetime value is going to be of any individual customer. So you just have to treat them all great. A hundred percent. And so many times A's are, A's and B's are cha changing constantly. Mm -hmm. Right. And then what does a C customer get? A C customer will probably get an email with the $50 gift card, not like the handwritten, you know, that's more of a mass email type situation mm -hmm. where she gets like, come in, get the fit, you know, it's, but 
The C customer is hard. That's still where I think our opportunity lies. That's still where myself and my manager are pushing our team. Like, let's work on those C's. Let's work on those C's because honestly, they don't have enough time. They're busy with their A's and their B's. And that opportunity to bring in more, there is so much more opportunity to develop our C lists. And we just, so whenever there's downtime, we're trying to, to, to develop them. But that is where, I'm excited because there's still that much opportunity. Like this is just anecdotal. This isn't, I don't have a ton of science to back this up, but like we tried, we, we felt like there was a lot of opportunity in our C customers. So two years ago, our, our top sales people are million dollar sellers and they, annually? what? Annually. Yes. Annually. Holy cow. Okay. So, um, in my, Big, my store that does the most revenue, um, two years ago, we had one million, like one million dollar seller and one hovering around 950. And we, I just felt like I know that there is opportunity there. Like for someone who really, I just feel like there's customer C's are being lost. Like, mm -hmm. so I decided to bring someone in, but and I, we had, ha, everyone had their client list and everyone was like, no, 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 we got it. We have, you know, I have lots of people on the sales floor. Everyone's being helped. Everyone's being mm -hmm. greeted and it, all that. It doesn't seem like there's it never seems like there's not enough people on the sales floor to help the amount of customers walking in the door. Right. So anyway, I brought in another full-time employee, 40 hours health benefits, the whole thing, salary plus commission. And I was like, let's see what bringing in another person could do. She didn't bring it. She didn't have a book of business. She didn't have any customers. She had a little bit of training. She had come from a department store as like an assistant. So she had like some raw talent, but like not, she wasn't bringing anything except a good attitude right. to the table. And in her first year of business just by picking up the the crumbs the seas her first year she did 750,000 in sales and in her second year she did a million dollars holy cow over a million so have you noticed uh, uh, when you book pre clienteling and post clienteling like you know you, so you've got a couple of sales people now that are million dollar sales people before clienteling what was your top salesperson doing annually? About 800. Okay. And now that same salesperson does 1.3. Right. Yeah. So and it's a she 60, didn't, like, 70%. we didn't, like, we're not advertising more. We're not doing, you know, my, it's the same store. There, you know, I've been there 20 years. Like, there wasn't a boom in, in real estate there. Everything else is the same. Yeah. It's just focus. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. All right, so a little bit of nuts and bolts. So client info, and you know, this would kind of vary based on how you intend to reach out to customers and and you know by, by business. But certainly name, cell phone, because so many people today like it's kind of cell phone. Or we experimented phone. a lot, and we have her. We have learned through at trial and error, and just asking that despite age, text is by far and away how they want to be reached out to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, while you're at it, you could also get their email. Mm -hmm. uh, you could get their birthday. You may get like their customer anniversary day if you want to do like a customer anniversary or uh, something like that. Date That's of birth if you want to send gifts or something like that. Uh, you probably make note of for their shopping preferences, you know, the brands they like, types of products they buy. Um, uh, I've heard of some folks even capturing like their the spouse's info so that they could reach out to the, their customer spouse okay. and say, Hey, I know Christmas is coming up in the next couple of months. Don't know if music's on your list, but if it is, you know, Bob's really been looking at this new tailor, blah, 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 blah. Um, and keeping a wish list. So these are all like some of the core things that most people that are really getting into clientele and capture. Is there anything else that you capture that is, might have universal um, application? Um, favorite brands, um, like, like for like maybe life events coming up. If you knew like something that they might want to splurge on something for themselves. So they would maybe be more likely to treat themselves in your case to like 
a new guitar if they thought like a big prom- they were going to get a big promotion or something that might like be willing to treat themselves to something like that um we so we keep we, when our staff starts we give them a sheet that we have pre-printed that we ask them to fill out themselves after the customer leaves we ask them to like find a few minutes like when, when there's a lull and they fill out this sheet just handwritten like so they can jot it down while they're thinking of it gotcha. um about the client so it's all that stuff that will help you when you're client telling and lots of people like to keep that in like a three ring binder and like revert to that there's something still that a lot of my client uh employees still want some handwritten um something handwritten to go with this google doc right almost um almost all of my employees don't rely solely on the google doc they want something that they can doodle on that they can write on that has a lot of information about their clients well it's it's easier too in the heat of the moment to quickly fill out write something down right to then later go update a document with which can be right. great uh, and then after that, basically acting on all this data, you're, you're printing out, you would mentioned before, you're printing out reports from your point of sale at the end of every day and, and that salespeople are kind of basically updating their, their client telling log with whatever happened. Um, you'd mentioned before about like setting calendar reminders, uh, for upcoming events for people, or maybe that wasn't you, maybe I got that from somewhere else. Um, as in our in- industry, maybe service reminders. So if someone buys a, yeah. a band instrument or a guitar from us then you know we know we need to be seeing that for service within so many months you know we could be setting up those reminders uh but you know g- kind of get into some of the nuts and bolts of how you actually use this data and reach out to customers and maybe also talk about the management of it because you shared with bob that like some of your employees kind of take this like a fish to water like they immediately see the benefits they get it they just dive in and do it and there's others that you know you've got to get the the stick and kind of keep <laughs> poking yeah. them to get them to do it um, so. yeah some of my some people just know like they're on a rotation like okay i reached out to her four weeks ago so i got it so it's time for me to reach out again they just know like what feels comfortable to them how often they can reach out and they manage themselves some we have to say like, okay, you have to reach out to 10 people a week, 20 people a week, depending on part-time, full-time, what we think is the right number. And every industry I think has to like decide that for themselves, but it should be way, whatever number you all have in your head right now, triple it. That's how many people they should be reaching out to because it's, you know, it's a numbers game. However many people you reach out to, if you reach out to 30 people, one person's going to bite. Don't get discouraged Mm -hmm. by that. And so many people that you reach out to, you might not hear, and they might not respond. They might not say anything. And you're like, Ooh, I wonder if they are mad that I texted them or if they don't like this. And then they come in the store the next day or a week later or two weeks later. And they're like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for texting me. I'm, I was so happy to get it that day. And all the while you're in your head thinking, oh, I hope I'm not being pushy. It's so, get all that, get all those stories out of your head. So for some people, that's why it's most important that your managers are on board. Your manager has to sit with them every week and be like, okay, show me your list. Who'd you reach out to this week? What kind of responses did you get? Are you struggling with this? Let me help you. Some people like a script. Here are four different text messages that you could send, copy and paste them and make them your own. That's okay too. Some people don't want that at all. The other thing we do for them is, you know, for me, it's visual. So we'll take, I'll take a bunch of pictures or whoever's good in that. I have a person who loves to take pictures in the store. So she'll take a bunch of pictures. She'll share them with the whole team and be like, here's the pictures of new products. I took, here's some great pictures of new products I took this week. Share them with your team, share them with your clients and everybody shares those. So if you have one, it, it's all, you know, great. So I'll get a bunch of pictures, send out a group text to my team because make it as easy for them as possible. Because if it's right there in their text group text message, all they have to do is copy the photo and resend it to their um, clients. And they'll text someone a picture mm-hmm. of a new guitar stand or a new guitar or whatever and say, this came in and, and I thought of you instantly. 
I thought you'd love it. Let me know if you want me to put it aside for you. Um, so constantly giving them content to reach out about will make it so much easier. Don't expect them to come up with the content on their own. I'm feeding my team content to, to text, to, to reach out all the time. That's my job. My job is giving them the content. Their job is making those connections and getting the customers to come in. Like get your vendors, when you get deliveries, get your vendors to send you photos, get your vendors to, I mean, I find that pictures you've taken yourself feel more authentic and that my, my clients respond better to that, but could be different in different industries. Like get your vendors to send you photos, get your vendors to send you cool things that you can text out to your clients, you know, get, get your team, the content I would say is where, where the owner's job lies. Yeah. And, you know, depending on the size of your company, you, you may like, we have a buyer that handles a lot of this type of stuff and uh, totally when it comes to getting like some marketing content images, he can, he can facilitate that. And a lot of our vendors will provide marketing images. They'll provide marketing scripts. And you're right. Like uh, as, uh, some salespeople may want to come up their own, but I know for me, sometimes it's been, it's just really handy to get in there and grab that marketing text or if nothing else, look at the marketing text they're providing and saying, all right, well, they've, look through this and decided they felt like these things are the most important things to highlight. So I'm going to say something in my own words, but that covers those same points. Um, right. But you're right. You essentially right. as an owner or manager, you want to try to make this program as easy for your salespeople to implement as possible, but it does have to be managed, right? I mean, uh, your store managers have to be going through this process and the more successful programs are the ones that are best managed, I would imagine. A hundred percent. The managers have to, the man, it, it, the managers, you, it has to be managed and they will, your, your team will say yeah. they are texting and they're not. You have to check. So uh, you're using Sorry. essentially Google docs and, and creating all of this stuff in a shared platform. And that's how you're following up with it mm -hmm. and managing it. It may be worth kind of mentioning. There are also some apps that do this. Um, I so far I've only found one yeah. that seems to be current and, and being updated and developed. It's a product called client book. Um, I'm actually trying to work out a deal with them to get some referral codes and some discounts for anyone that looks into it, but it, it sort of takes a lot of this process and, and automates it, but it does it at a, a, it's a, it's a monthly fee and it's not inexpensive. I want to say it starts at $300 a month or something like that, but um, you know, it may be worthwhile uh, for those who have a lot of customers to not have to, you know, cause there's some downside to like the Google docs spreadsheet, you know, that whole process, you know, it's hard, hard for Definitely. people. They can't really, you won't keep up with the Google they docs. do it on their phone. Yeah. You catching back up to it can be a real problem. And I know client book, there's an app so you can do it on your phone. And then, uh, there's a whole dashboard for managers to see which customers have been, uh, um, contact and who hasn't. And one of the neat things client book does too, is they sort of gamify it. So they'll rank salespeople based on their customer contacts. And, you know, you're in first place with customer contact, you're in 12th place. And, you know, there's just, there's some stuff about it that is definitely appealing. Uh, but you don't have to do, you know, spend the money and do it that way. You could do it just as something as simple as a spreadsheet, just like how you got started. I was just going to say never before, did I realize how much of my business relies on these customer connections with, from employee to customer than when this pandemic hit and we are um, doing, the only business we're doing is um, through these approval boxes. You know, we don't have, we've since put up a small website, but at the, you know, in those first weeks we, didn't have a website. We have three brick and mortar stores. And we had this small sect of our business where we would send you a box, not charge you anything, try on everything at home, keep what you like, send back the rest. So I was like, all right, well, that's the only way we're going to be able to do business. So we got to get the message out there. Everyone, please tell your clients everything. I sent out this beautiful email about it. We had professional, I had images, you know, stocked. We, you know, I, I put out, anyway, email campaign, mass text campaign, blah, blah, blah. 
two leads, two. My staff, we had seven people who were willing to, to do some work on it. Uh, we sent in those first few weeks, 150 boxes. Well, you know, we've, this is something that, uh, you know, our people can start brainstorming on ideas of what they want to do. And even if you've got people that are at home, this is a great time to start kind of thinking about this stuff. Some of the other things that I heard that I felt, felt like were really applicable to our industry about, you know, sending customers thank you cards or thank you texts two weeks after purchase, uh, calling on repairs after a week to make sure the client's happy, uh, reaching out to customers who made purchases six months ago, and then also sending um, a message to customers who haven't been in for a while. These are all like things you can do that will immediately, uh, well, it'll immediately, immediately, immediately put money in the register, but more importantly than that, like we'll have a, a, an immediate positive impact on the quality of relationship we have with our customer. Definitely. And the other thing I love about it too, is it takes, you know, you think about like a, a new salesperson comes into your store uh, to begin working, you know, traditionally, it just takes that person such a long time to develop a, a client base and to, to ramp up their sales and build their income. Well, if they're coming in, let's say, especially if they're coming in and taking over for a, a prior salesperson, I mean, you can assign that person's, uh, you know, customers or, or however, maybe not all of them, if, you know, if they're not up to it or whatever, but you can assign that relationship over to the new person that new person can go through and, and, and reach out to other people, see customers or inactive customers and start building a book of business from day one. And maybe it can be like the gal that you hired that you know first year has really a tremendous level of success, but then the next year becomes a million dollar seller. And uh, you know, giving those right. people the tools, basically like a knowledge base, a resource to, to build this customer database uh, is gonna be so much more impactful and helpful to our salespeople and our employees and our customers versus just making them grind it out year after year after year. The fear that used to come when somebody quit or somebody left, it's just no longer there because we, we, have, we know who their clients were. We know how to make sure we assign them to the right person. Onboarding is so much easier. We can, sh we can show like, okay, look, here's, we definitely give them C, you know, we definitely share C customers from, other people, that's been so much easier. The other thing we've been able to see is like, just the, the tracking of like, that customer seasonal spend and it's just the focus. Like when we send someone, when we look at our A's and we send them that $200 gift card that I talked to you about, we just, our, our sales went up so much because we just don't let them go. We know who our A's are, we know who's in charge of helping them, and we just watch them under a microscope. And once they come in and they spend their $200 gift card, we're not done. We have a whole season left with them. So did they come in again? Did they pick up the, their special orders? Did they pick up their alterations? Okay, and what did they spend that time? And what did they spend for the whole season? And we're, oh, they're, on, they're going on vacation now? Did they buy their clothes for their vacation? We just have those, those A customers, especially because that's 80% of our business, under this microscope with all of my team working together manageably because there's enough of us. And we just like have our, our thumb on their, on their foreheads knowing that we are not gonna lose any of their business. We are gonna own their whole closet. And in your case, they are not gonna buy any of their guitars music or accessories from anyone else you are going to own them because of this system i love it well this has been really fantastic is there anything else you can think of that needs to be shared for anyone who wants to get started with this um just like the same thing that bob says which is i'm sharing a lot of bobisms today um don't let perfectionism get in the way of progress like sometimes when i share this with people they feel overwhelmed or like, well, and like a lot of people say like, well, I don't, my staff doesn't work on commission or my POS system isn't great. Like don't let any of those excuses stop you. There are ways around all of those things. You can still reward your staff in other ways. You can start this with a notebook and a piece of paper. The, the concept is the concept, you know, it's, it's a way of, th of thinking about your business and, 
and just focusing your business that is the most important thing to take away. That's such a great point. And I, I love that phrase. I use it all the time about not letting perfection get in the way of progress. And, and you're so right because so many times people can think like, well, gosh, I don't have all these things. I don't have all the stuff that Marine has. I don't have million dollar sellers. Uh, and you can kind of throw everything out without thinking about, wait a minute, how can I make this work for me? And even if you didn't go through all of your customers, if you just said, well, I know what my best customers are. I can write them down and you decide like, hey, I'm going to just have nothing else. I'm going to clientele my best customers. And if you started there, that's a starting point. You can, you can grow from that little thing and over time grow it. Because if, you know, your clientele program you have today isn't what you started with. It's much bigger and more sophisticated. So just no start. Start in some way, even yeah. if it's something small. And, uh, and then, you know, over time, yeah. start to grow it and build it, especially as your business, as your business grows. I mean, I just think it applies to every industry, every price point, every average sale. You know, if, you're, if your best sellers are selling $50,000 a year, wouldn't you like them to sell 75? Because that's what I think this yeah. would do. Yeah. I, you know, I, I would guess in our industry, you know, a, a good salesperson selling over 100000 a year and a really good salesperson is probably 300000 or more. Uh, now you get into some markets like Los Angeles, New York. There's, there could be million dollar salespeople there just because of population density, but in Kansas or Nebraska or something, <laughs> something like that, probably not so much, but still it's all relative. You know, if I can take my, my hundred thousand right. dollar salesperson and make them a hundred and fifty thousand dollar salesperson, how much more can I pay them? You know, how, how much more are they benefiting, benefiting from it? How much more can that money that comes into my business go out and, and I can use it for other things to help, grow and improve our business, how much better can I service my customers? Also, as strange as it may sound, how much happier are my customers? You know, how much happier would Definitely. Bob have been if he would have, when he got his glasses, if he would have bought the, the cleaner and the screwdriver and all the stuff all at the totally. same time? Uh, you know, it's, it's, yes, yes, totally. So, well, this is going to be really exciting. So uh, I want to thank you so much for sharing your, your, knowledge and, and, and passion and info today. Uh, you know, I think certainly anyone who's, who's uh, interested and, and uh, has a need should definitely check out your shop, especially if they're in uh, Philadelphia at some point. Uh, but this has been really, really excellent. I know for me, when I first heard this concept, I had a lot of questions about it. And I've uh, listened to a lot of the things that you said and done and took notes. And I hope that other people find it useful as well. Uh, and hope that everyone can get a chance to put these things into place. And if you do reach out to me, let me know. I want to hear and share some of our best practices. But Maureen, you've been awesome. Your time today has just been super, super useful. Well, that's a wrap for this episode. If you'd like help with your business, check out musicretailconsulting.com for articles, resources, and coaching and consulting services. Also, you can subscribe to this podcast so you're aware of future updates and rate and review while you're at it. Thanks for listening.